So hi everyone, welcome to today's um, Expert Talks Online. I'm Caitlin Smith, I'm a delivery lead at Equal Experts, and I'm currently working on a HMRC on a large scale data platform. Today we are welcoming Simon Case, who is the head of the data services at Equal Experts, as well as Paul Brannan, a data engineer, and Scott Cutts, who is one of our principal data engineers at Equal Experts. Simon um, is the head of the EE data service. And since studying AI in the 90s, he has worked with many clients in many sectors to understand and use um, how to use their data better, whether that is applying machine learning algorithms to um, business problems or creating environments that help them generate insight from that data. Paul has a, a background in software engineering and data related uh, disciplines. He's solved data engineering, data science and machine learning problems for a variety of clients, large and small, and is currently part of Equal Experts Data Studio. We'd also like to welcome Scott. Scott has been an engineer with Equal Experts for six years, but has over 15 years experience. For quite a bit of that, he's worked down under and then moved to the UK. He accidentally discovered data engineering several years ago and found it surprisingly enjoyable and not just a buzzword. He has been um, earnestly learning about munging data, applying machine learning, and spinning up pipelines ever since with a big focus um, on real-time data. Scott is currently the data architect on the Customer Insight platform at HMRC and an active member of EE's data community. Simon, Paul, and Scott are going to talk to us today about some of the techniques they've used to create the data pipelines, productionize the data science, and op opera operationally um, machine learning. So you can start um, adding some of your questions now using the Zoom Q&A function. So feel free to pop those on as um, the talks go on. Um, we'll be answering the top voted questions at the end. So keep an eye on what questions um, have been added and vote for the ones that you'd like to see covered. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Simon, Paul and Scott. Hi, thanks Caitlin, thanks for that. Um, I just wanna uh, start off with saying that, uh, uh, yeah, in, in, in EE, we do a lot with data. There's lots of things we do, but, but kind of broadly, it's in these kind of three areas. There's um, uh, data engineering, so kind of providing the data pipelines to people. Uh, there's the creating the algorithms, so you know whether that's a risking or pricing or uh, recommendations, all those sorts of things, doing the algorithms, or it's the the, the whole ML ops uh, 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 side of things, you know, supporting supporting the people who are creating the algorithms and providing them with the data that they need. Um, um, we 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 do, as I say, we do a lot in this area. We like to share it with the community, so it's great that uh, people have joined us today. This is all part of, of, of our sharing, effectively. Um, uh, some some links here you can go to. If you go to any of those links, um, you'll find some interesting stuff and lots of other interesting things around it. So ones that are kind of popular right now, um, we've we've been using DBT for a, a couple of years now. It's a tool that we really like. People have had a lot of success with it. Um, and uh, uh, Claudio, one of our our data specialists, has been. Uh, has put together a blog there on on the work he's done on effectively using writing unit tests with dbt dbt and um you know applying sort of tdd principles uh, there's also a really nice uh, a blog that paul who is uh, going to be talking to you later on has done about um uh, tips for handling data in data warehouses kind of very much aimed at, at data scientists who, who who might be kind of sort of newer to the kind of the nuances of 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 sql the really interesting one there if you're a data scientist and you're kind of looking to uh, you know the right ways to do stuff in, in SQL. There, uh, we have expert talks online like this one. Uh, uh, but we did a recently. We've done other ones. We've done um, on going from data storage into a data product team, and there's some other great ones on our on our ETO website um, and playbooks. Um, so we have a E does a, a number of play has done a number of playbooks over the years. Um, we've provided one of data pipelines that we think is really good. So look at it. And we are also um, uh, currently working on one on operationalizing machine learning playbook, very much around, you know, the sorts of things that um, we're talking about here, you know, all the, this is some examples you're going to hear today of where we've, we've, we have operationalized machine learning, but it's kind of pulling out the, you know, the principles and the practices that we found to be useful. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk first about um, a recent piece of work to create a tool for estimating the prices of used vehicles for one of our clients. 
Um, it's a great piece of work, I think, um, and, a, and a really good example of the sorts of things we do in the data world because it includes some data engineering. There's a whole bunch of pipeline stuff going on in there. Uh, there's some algorithmic development. There's a, a pricing algorithm. Um, and then there's the whole ML ops side of supporting that, supporting the retraining of the algorithm and, and connecting it into the business. Um, so I thought it was a really great one to share today. Um, I'm going to cover uh, you know, what the objective was, what we were asked to do, um, what team we had to do, it, how we delivered it effectively, how we worked together to deliver the solution. Uh, little, little, some notes about the data effectively and some of the challenges we had with it. Um, and sort of share with you sort of the, in, in broad terms, the architecture we used to, to meet that need. Um, I hope it will give you some ideas about how we like to tackle these sorts of problems, you know, how we like to organize ourselves, um, and, and an example architecture, who doesn't love an example architecture um, that we use to manage the data and the machine learning. Uh, I'm just going to outline the challenge first. Um, so we were asked to create a tool uh, which was able to estimate the price of a used vehicle. You can all imagine the sort of thing. You know, what's the estimated price for a five-year-old Ford Fiesta with 60,000 miles on the clock in the UK? Um, we started with largely a blank sheet of uh, paper in terms of what was in place. So we're able to start from the beginning to work out what the tool should do and how it should do it. Obviously, a critical part of the work was working with the data. Um, so we needed to explore the data, understand it, and, and, and prototype and create and evaluate the pricing algorithms. Um, but as well, we had to develop the pipelines for, for processing that data in production. You know, how do we took the data out from the various sources and brought it together and uh, uh, made it available to the algorithm in, in production. Um, but another really important part was the user experience. Um, so the users are not data scientists. Um, they wouldn't be, why would you be? Um, so we spent a lot of time working out what visualizations would work for them, how to show the estimates in a way that would give them confidence in the results. Um, and because we are big believers in continuous delivery and CICD and all that good stuff, an important part of the work was creating that environment. Um, so you know, the system can be continuously amended and updated without drama. And that's the space it's in right now. You know, we continually being uh, added to and amended and improved. So uh, how did we do this? Um, well, we like to work in, in cross-functional teams. Equal experts, as I'm sure many of you know, is a network of experienced developers and specialists. But typically we have over 10 years of experience, so we really like to work in flat teams. Um, in this case, the team was composed of a, a data scientist who was working really closely with the data engineer to create those data pipelines. And obviously the data scientist was, was prototyping and, and, and creating the algorithms. Uh, we had a UX designer and some UX developers working with the users to understand their needs, how to expose the pricing estimates um, that were made, how to make it easy for them to, 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 to ask for an estimate. Um, and a platform engineer was there to, to do all the CICD and the terraforming and all those, all those good things. Um, as a team, we worked to, to, to the principles here. Uh, can you see my pointer? No, you probably can't see my pointer. Um, uh, to the principles here. I've talked about one team. I've talked about um, continuous delivery, um, but other stuff I think that we, 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 we tried to follow is we, we try to be lean in our architectural choices generally, um, and generally we don't design everything up front. Um, obviously, we'll, we'll, we'll make some decisions early on, but then we, uh, we pivot away from those if the design when it's not right. Um, we had one example, I think, where we, uh, we started off with a tool called DVC. It's a great tool. It's a really nice tool for uh, versioning data um, and we thought that'd be really helpful but in the end um, we found it, it really didn't give us the benefits we needed and so we pivoted to something much simpler um, uh, yeah okay um, so we went through uh, oh, the last thing there sorry the last point on the principles there are that it's user-centered um, like most of our work we want a tool that is easy for, for our users we want, to, we, want, we want something that's easy for them to use. And so we need to understand their needs and provide an interface that works for them rather than one that's great for data scientists. Um, so that was an important, as I say, an important part of the work. Um, we went through a, a fairly typical process, um, starting with the proof of concept, um, understanding that da data, exploring the data, trying out some candidate algorithms, um, getting some feedback effectively from the users about whether those things gave them the sorts of prices they would they'd expect or not. Um, we initially tried to uh, create some visualizations in Power BI. 
um, uh, but it became clear that um, that they, they wouldn't meet the visual visualization needs of the users. The users actually need more something more sophisticated than that. So when we went into the next phase of creating a production system, we pivoted to the use of React. Um, that was a kind of a big architectural change that we made um, and created that, that user interface in the React. Um, but also within that production system, of course, we, uh, we, we created those production data pipelines um, and all the ML ops infrastructure and monitoring that, that, that you want to have in place. Uh, and then, of course, because at that point we were getting more data in, we were able to refine the model and continue with that validation process of the, of the, of the algorithms. Uh, right now we're in this third phase here of operation ref refinement. It's been in, it's been working uh, for in, in, in operations for over a year now, uh, you know, working, uh, reaching users kind of globally effectively. Um, and uh, uh, the work is just monitoring those pipelines of the data, making sure that everything stays up, um, uh, as well as the, um, uh, some refinement on the user, uh, user interface and kind of some improvements to the user interface. Um, um, so the data, the data, um, uh, it, it, it came from a variety of sources. Um, lots of different kind of places have uh, information about uh, uh, used car prices, um, and they've kind of uh, and and as well that the the sources were overlapped. So we had about ten thousand rows a week, and there was a lot of overlap between them. So the, the sorts of challenges that we had were how do you match across those data sources? You know, where people report things slightly differently and sales actually the same sale can be slightly different so you have to be a bit careful careful what you do with kind of deduping um there's some data quality challenges um you know some of the data needs to be cleansed of course there's some missing data um and we took the choice effectively where we could to, to impute the values where they were possible because that's better for the machine learning um and the other thing i think was really important was the master data challenges you've got things coming in from lots of different sources so you have to kind of come up with an agreed model effectively of important fields and for those for us really those fields with a product hierarchy um and, and the geography um onto the architecture now so the tool is implemented in aws uh, and the key parts of the architecture are implemented as, as microservices and fargate or as lambdas um data lands in an s3 bucket at the top right here um and that triggers a data pipeline uh, which is hosted in a Fargate container. Um, and it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a relatively simple pipeline. So it's implemented in Python uh, with separate modules for each pipeline stage and a very simple Python orchestration. As I said, we, we originally used DVC to manage some of those things, but even that, which is a, sort of a, even that was a more complex than we needed. So we went to something simpler, um, uh, which had less disk and memory usage. Um, the algorithm training is hosted in a separate container um uh, around here uh, which is triggered at the end of the pipeline run so data comes in it triggers a, a, a algorithm kind of update um and the output of that is a is, is a binary effectively which is saved into an s3 bucket um and the estimator service is prompted to, to update that model uh the estimator service is in the, in the bottom thing uh, around about here there um, so this at inference estimator model is hosted as another Fargate service. The model can be called pretty frequently in a short space of time. So we have a, a load balancer in front uh, to meet the demand. Um, just one other thing was during this work, uh, Snowflake was adopted as a corporate data warehouse for our, by our client. So it's relatively straightforward to add another step to, to move the data into Snowflake to make that data more widely available across the business. Um, so I hope that's given you an idea of how we like to approach these sorts of projects. Uh, and, and as I say, as a sample architecture, I'm going to hand over now to Paul. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Simon. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm Paul Raven. I'm a, a data specialist working with the Equal Experts Data Studio right now. And I've been having a great time working with uh, a team for, for the past year or two uh, on uh, a large retailer's search engine, improving that search engine, making it help, helping it serve customers better. So. I don't know if you've, if you've never worked in this domain before, I'll give you a really brief introduction. Next slide, please. Um, basically, and I would, I'd encourage you next time you use a, a retail search engine, which probably won't be too long, given um, how, the way you do shopping these days, um, have a look for some of the things we're going to talk about here. You'll find that everyone's doing them. So to try to summarize the overall 
sort of problem statements, if you like, that um, a, a, an econ product owner is trying to solve. Um, customers need to be able to find what they're looking for because if they can't find it, they can't buy it. And if they can't buy it, you fail. So kind of a simple idea, but there's an awful lot going on. So I'm going to just take the example of the no results page and classic sort of search engine thing. Uh, I just typed in Ruby slippers and there are, there are no products that actually match in the search engine. So by default, you'll get you'd say, well, no, no results page 20 years ago. That's what you would have done. But that's problematic because that's conversation over. There's nowhere for the customer to go now. So they haven't found what they were looking for. They definitely can't buy it if you let the conversation end. So there's all sorts of things you can do on here. You could get meta and go searching for what to do on a search no, no results found page. There's lots of advice out there, but I'll give you a few examples of what is recommended. So one thing you could do is you could put some category suggestions on there. You might not be able to answer Ruby slippers, but you might be able to tell that you're looking for footwear and put and point you in the direction of the right category, for example. Something else we could do is suggest some alternative alternative search terms, kind of a did you mean sort of sort of setup or uh, the kind of search terms that other customers who searched for what you just searched for, what else did they go on to search for? We could show you some of those, some, some examples of what other customers searched for, um, helping you to potentially crowdsource uh, the, the information that you need to be able to find what you're looking for in our search engine. Uh, the uh, like a, a, a standard is recommendations. If we know anything about you, or if we, uh, on, a more, on a less kind of personal level, if we know about popularity of products generally, we can. If we don't know what you're, if we don't know what you're actually looking for, we could just stick some products up there um that you might be looking for because they tend they are popular or because you've shown something behavior in the past that demonstrates you might be interested in them you know better than nothing and of course there's all there's, there's always ads and uh you, know, you, you look, look on a typical search engine and you'll find sponsored sponsored content on there um some of these things kind of have to be driven by data I mean, recommendations for example i don't think there's really anyone trying to do that without actually mining the data that, cus that customers leave behind to try and figure out what, what you might be able to serve them. I mean, the other example I gave was uh, just showing people very popular products. Uh, how do you know they're popular if you don't have data behind them? The category suggestions you could potentially try to solve with, with a rule-based rule system or something like that. But pretty much everything you, you could do, uh, the things I just mentioned, um, they're either made better or enabled full stop by data. So data for an e-commerce um, uh, for an e-commerce search system uh, can be a real a really big deal. Next slide, please. OK, so this is so we're, let me give you a little bit of context as to the little story I'm going to tell you. I landed in a team that had just re-implemented um, a, a large retailer search engine online. Um, it was going really, really well. Super cool team, obviously. There was, there was EE e people in there and some, some great um, um, sort of client people uh, doing a fantastic job. The kind of characteristics this team had, they committed DevOps, they were shipping constantly, like daily, in, intraday. It was really cool. Hated delays and dependencies, liked getting things done. A little bit of technical context, they were using things like Kubernetes, cloud services. Um, they were using uh, the programming language they were using. Uh, no, the main thing for this conversation is that it wasn't Python. And the last thing that I've just mentioned as a general context thing is that uh, you may or may not be aware that data engineers are actually quite hard to get hold of in the market right now. They are, um, there's a lot of demand and there's not a lot of supply. So data engineering as a specialism is actually quite hard to get hold of. So there's a bit of context. I'm well, in the team, cross-functional team, just like Simon's uh, Simon's example. Um, we had um, a, uh, so I landed as data as a, as a data person alongside a, a data scientist, we got very capable data scientist, um, and then the product, the rest of the engineering team uh, in there. The data scientist was doing lots of good work. The, the team recognised the need and the value for data. The data scientist is taking um, those ideas, coming up with their own ideas. They're diving into the data warehouse and running queries and performing uh, analysis in, in Python code and, and whatnot. Uh, producing reports and um, information to drive decisions and even uh, files full of data that can be used to actually enable products like um, like, this, like I just mentioned, like um, popular searches and things like that. Problem with that situation, as I'm sure you probably all think, immediately jump into is you've got a person, an expensive person whose time is very valuable and an opportunity cost to not using them to do data science. The data scientists going in there doing this data, they work by hand. We've got a timeliness problem. We can't really plan for frequent updates. If we want to drive a system with data directly, we want the data to be updated 
in it's on in a timely fashion. I mean, daily was kind of what I'd use a typical benchmark. We need to be doing daily updates as, as sort of a minimum. Um, if a data scientist is going and doing work, we best hope that they're writing down what they're doing or they're writing scripts because if they're ill and we need it done, then somebody else is going to have to go do it. Hopefully they've got access. Um, it's expensive. Data scientist is a person, but a highly skilled person. Every time we're taking their time, as I mentioned, they're not doing other things. And siloing. So the data scientist is using Python. And frankly, it's weird Python at that. Have you ever seen the kind of the, the kind of code data scientists write? I mean, you know, function signatures that go takes the data frame and produces a data frame. Yeah, you probably did something in between. Um, product engineers don't don't write code like that, even if they understand even if they understand the Python. It's kind of it's kind of weird. So the goal that I had landing in the team was that the data scientist and the other members of the team would be able to perform analyses and build data-driven products without the intervention of external or external to the team data engineering dependencies. So that's the goal that, that, kind of set, set, that we kind of set, set myself with the team. So next slide, please. The next steps to, the next step to take and everyone was pretty clear that the next thing we need to do is actually introduce some automation, clearly, uh, solving this manual intervention problem. We focus, so like I said, I didn't say it was a very capable team. They were already doing key decision records. So we had a very kind of well laid out sort of process for making decisions, encouraging you to look at the options and write things down, which is great. So if I could refer back to that for this talk. Um, we were looking primarily at capabilities of the system to do what we needed it to do. We had a couple of pipelines that were pretty complicated that we had in mind um, and, and took a while to run. So could it actually do what we needed it to do? Um, we were looking for as simple a solution as possible, given those capabilities, cost-effective solution, um, a solution that could integrate with what we needed to integrate with, um, primarily services for our, from a cloud provider, and familiarity, like the, 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 least of it, the, 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 the least jump there is from the kind of things that the product engineering team in particular is doing to, to, to this kind of, to this automation system, the better, because really we want to be self-sufficient self in this world. Airflow was the obvious choice. Um, that was the first thing we looked at. I was looking at this with um, a, 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 a less data specialist teammate. Um, we dived in there, we're having a look, look at Airflow. Um, we didn't like it very much. I have to admit, as a data specialist, I'd never actually used Airflow in anger. I've witnessed it being used from afar, um, but I've not actually used it directly myself. So we were kicking the tires of this thing and, and seeing how it worked. And we, um, we found a, a few things we didn't like very much about it. One of the, a couple of things I'll call out. So certainly not kubernetes and container native um i think uh, airflow kind of predates that a little bit um and the api was is, is weird and hard to uh, kind of hard to get your head around if you're not in that in that world of airflow things um there are a few other few other issues it kind of put airflow scored badly for 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 those reasons basically a few a few reasons the familiarity thing was was a long way off other things we looked at so i mean the next thing really that we looked at was something called kubeflow um which and we're talking a year or two ago that we did this work. So I don't think much has changed in the meantime, but just in case. So at the time, Kubeflow, much more modern, very container-based, container, container -based, um, like cloud-native, Kubernetes-native solution. Um, it was looking, from those perspectives, looked pretty good. Um, <clears throat> it was still Python-centric. You might pipe your pipelines in Python. Um, so there's still that leap to get over. Um, relatively complex and very machine learning centric. Um, I don't actually know whether you can build very simple pipelines that just move data from A to B in Kubeflow. Um, but certainly all the examples we were looking at were kind of building machine learning pipelines and iterative models and so forth. So when we were looking at documentation, we discovered something called Argo, which uh, Kubeflow was built on top of and actually does the workflows underneath. So we looked at Argo and that's what we ended up going with. It's a good balance for us at the time, we thought. Um, language agnostic, it doesn't demand Python. It's container cloud native, configuration, configuration via YAML, which you're probably gonna be familiar with for the team using Kubernetes a lot. This seemed like a good choice and that is what we started. That's what we went with to, to start out. Next slide, please. And we built something that looks a bit like this. Um, which is not too complicated, really. Um, we have, I'll, I'll just walk you through what, 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 what we ended up building here to get things done. So obviously you can see the S code on the right there, or idea. Um, we wrote code and workflow manifests. We pushed them into a CI CD system, which was uh, GitLab. Uh, from there, we would build container images that would contain kind of Python code that we were gonna run in the pipelines. The actual DAGs, the cyclic graph, it's a, a manifest for a workflow, basically a, a definition. Uh, the DAGs would get pushed to the Argo cluster that we were running on top of Kubernetes, on top of some infrastructure. 
And those DAGs, when they when they ran, which sometimes mostly off schedules, sometimes off events, would actually pull the images they needed from the container registry when they needed them, do their work interacting with the data, which would create new data. It would create data sets that we could push into uh, our products. It would produce reporting. It would <clears throat> um, and we could even drive cloud ML services uh, to kind of start dipping our toes in, in real machine learning machine learning models. So all in not too many pieces. I mean, it, we would have had a similar complexity, I imagine, if we had put some, if we'd used um, uh, Airflow, for example. Um, but there's still quite a few moving pieces here. Uh, it's still, as it turns out in practice, still quite hard for the data for the non-data specialists to kind of get their heads around what was going on in here a little bit. Um, and so this this is where we started, basically. Um, one thing I'll point out is that GitLab is involved here. It's doing two things. It's pushing images to the, it's building images from the containers and it's pushing DAGs to Argo to do the work. So this kept us going for over a year, which was which was quite good. Uh, it didn't take a huge amount of work to get it up and running and it and it it got us up and it got us moving. Uh, one year later, skipping forward one year, on, stay on this slide, please don't move forwards. Um, we definitely unlocked the data-driven work and automation. We had built maybe a half a dozen, possibly more than that workflows. We built a bunch of new features into the search engine that were being driven by data. Now we'd done countless analyses that would have been very difficult or impossible to do before because we were able to actually start building logic on top of logic we'd already built, we'd, we'd already created to start becoming, to start moving forwards instead of going around in circles. Um, so from that point of view, I, I, I should point out, I should also mention um, there were key business metrics that are demonstrably lifted since we were doing this work. Uh, it's difficult to pull out our contribution to that from other things that were going on in the organization, but certainly we, um, uh, we, we I would like to think that we took some, a decent amount of credit for, for those lifts. So definitely unlocked data-driven work and automation, but did not meet the goal because it had not eliminated the need for me as data engineer. I basically was running this infrastructure, which is a terrible position for me to be in as a, as a consultant in the team. Um, it's not what I should be doing. Um, Argo is still excessively hard for non-specialists to use. And I put that down largely to just the, the, non, the, the product engineers didn't need to use it very often. So when they needed to use it, they could learn how to use it and get something done and it would be fine, but then they wouldn't use it again for six weeks and they would come back basically as if they'd never used it, used it before. They'd have to learn how to use it again. It wasn't a very efficient way of getting things done. The last thing was it turned out those complex workflows I mentioned, yeah, well, we A-B tested them and they turned out to do more harm than good, so we got rid of those. Um, thanks to the data, we, we could tell all that stuff. Um, we got rid of the complex workflows, and actually, what was left was relatively simple workflows. So we can get by. We could, turns out we can get by with slightly simpler things. We were also pushing. We learned to push work into the data warehouse and to push work into the uh, the cloud-based ML workflow system as well. So there's kind of not as much complex work for Argo to do that we, as we expected. And then one of my in, in a peer team that we were working with, um, we were working on a combined sort of should we continue using Argo? Again, going through that key decision process and. Well, somewhere on there was like, why don't we just use GitLab? And one of my teammates and the other team said, have we actually seriously considered that? I kind of ruled it out. I don't know why, because I'm an idiot, probably. But yeah, he suggested that we actually can seriously consider um, GitLab. And so we did. And this is what happened. Next slide, please. So we moved a couple of workflows onto GitLab. Um, and but when I say move them onto GitLab, we were using GitLab to orchestrate the workflow instead of Argo. Neither GitLab nor Argo was really doing the heavy lifting, where there was a lot of data to process or some heavy computation to do. It was mostly being done in the data warehouse or in the cloud ML system. So all they were really doing was coordinating activities and, and running essentially scripts for us. Um, and when we got confident that actually GitLab could do the job and start stripping away the rest of the infrastructure, this is what we were left with. So. Let me just run through some of the reasons why GitLab actually works for us. So some of the things GitLab has, so it certainly has DAGs, it certainly has these workflow definitions. If you've ever used GitLab or another similar CI system, you create these declarative files and they essentially describe a, a series of nodes in a graph that you uh, that, that are orchestrated and coordinated by, by the CI system. Um, it's a similar thing to what Airflow does. Um, they support schedule-based triggering, they support actual event-based triggers. They support artifacts and moving those around. They support uh, the scalable systems because they support very big organizations doing lots of um, build work. Uh, 
there's a big focus on operability in these things because again they support big organizations doing lots of build work so integrations with slack and pager duty all this sort of thing is already there the uh, GitLab certainly is container native. I know that there's other, several other CI systems that I've used R as well. Language agnostic, um, lots of lots of um, R back and security stuff. And I'd also say lots of eyes on the security stuff all across your organization, every other organization using that CI system as well. But the key thing is it's familiar. It's, it's a people problem. This are always the ones that are tricky to solve, right? The GitLab is already familiar to the project engineering team because they're using it every day to build all the rest of the stuff they're doing. So. After, after switching the workflows to run on GitLab, I was getting, look, there's been two or three occasions now. This We did this probably about three or four months ago. There's been two or three occasions since then when the, the engineering team has decided to do a problem that can actually be looked at as a data engineering problem to do it in this way in GitLab rather than just writing a custom code solution for it, which I take as a, a very strong sort of like positive, we're probably heading in the right direction. Essentially so far, I've not really found anything missing that actually matters from GitLab that you might find in a data engineering tool. And the next slide, last last slide for me is this one. So that's the story. Uh, as I said, about four four months ago or so that we actually made the shift. Everything is going well so far. Um, time will tell, but uh, time's positive. So I thought just as been doing this talk, I try to distill why I think it worked. This has worked for us, and why what you might want to consider in whether it may or may not work for you, and just the future of data pipeline technology generally. So. We, as I said, so you've got modern data warehouses there on the right, like Snowflake, um, Redshift, BigQuery, and others. These are these these systems are really like big compute clusters. They're not re relational databases in the traditional sense, right? So you're you're they're actually capable of doing huge amounts of work over huge amounts of data. So uh, including essentially using using views and what we call them um, ELT pipelines is a, a sort of um, extra, extra instead of doing the transformations by moving data around in the data warehouse you do transformations by creating views over the data and then pulling it as you need it um, with these sorts of capabilities and, and improved ingestion capabilities more flexibility I think this one data warehouse is putting pressure on the, the the kind of specialist data engineering pipeline tooling um, that didn't used to be there uh, from the from the right hand side. From the left hand side, we've got systems, CI CD systems like GitLab, like Concourse, or all the other, these other amazing sort of CI CD systems that are actually really encroaching on the same space of I need to orchestrate a series of tasks in some way. So there's some pressure, I think, coming on pipeline technology from that direction as well. And lastly, in terms of people, like as I mentioned at the beginning, data engineers are really hard to find. If you need to hire data engineers right now, good luck, unless you've got really deep pockets. Um, product engineers, are, you know, good product engineers are still hard to find, but easier. And they're probably already there. So living off the land, finding ways to use the people and the skills that they've already got to get things done with data. You'll probably find that you, if you look at it the right way, you already are doing that. You just don't call it data pipelines. And we talked about that a lot in blog posts. Um, but uh, yeah, from these three perspectives, like familiarity and living off land with people, using your CI CD systems and the modern data warehouses, I think we'll see less need for specialized tooling that just focuses on essentially moving data around uh, as we go forwards. Last couple of things I would mention before I wrap up. Um, the context I'm working in here is like a team trying to be autonomous in its own right. I'm not building a data platform. Scott's going to talk more about that. So that may be an important context element to this. I'm not sure. Um, but also, um, tooling like Terraform and, they, and some data engineering tooling like DBT um, is still being used here to, um, to get things done. So it's not like all the data and all the data specialist tooling is, is necessarily gone, but we can probably get rid of an awful, we can also get rid of a lot of it, which um, we just kind of lowered the bar enough that it's just about manageable now. Um, and that's the story of um, my work with the retailer recently. Over to Scott. Yes, thanks Paul. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Scott. I've uh, been working at EE in data for uh, quite a bit of time now. And I'm going to kind of take a bit more, I guess, a kind of a step up and um, kind of a higher level and talk about um, how we kind of on a client move from kind of application software engineering focus to, to data platform and a data, and a data focus. And how data science was a, kind of a core part of that and how it grew alongside it. Thanks. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, so um really this is like kind of a, a kind of i guess a journey of kind of scaling and growing as, as a team and going on a data journey and this team like the, the main problem is around fraud and risking uh and solving that uh, i guess with data and analytics 
and as and as the and it was a team that kind of offshoot from like a large kind of application platform which already existed i was collecting data from that platform and, and doing the forward risking um using that data from that application platform and the, and as that platform grew the data set grew that we had to work with so we went from gigabit gigabytes to petabytes of data the users grew as well uh, from tens to thousands and we went on we really went on this journey where we were really seeing it as a software engineering problem solving it with software engineering skills to moving into data engineering and data science and that all grew as that grew as part of the platform and as we went along next please sorry. so kind of going back to the start um, we basically were ingesting kind of JSON event stream data from a bunch of customer, customer facing applications into like an unstructured data store. And that data store would form the focus points for our fraud investigators. They could go into that data store, you know, do, do some um, analytics, they could create dashboards on top. And to kind of help them out um, with kind of more complex analysis across that data store, we created a this case working application for looking at fraud uh, using software engineering skills. And we basically ingested data from that unstructured data store. We did a bunch of data munging in, in software, like in code. Uh, this was like a Scala JVM based application. We pushed that out to an IDS. So some nice summarized data there and that would get served up to the case investigators in a nice view that they could, they could look at and click through and investigate without having have any knowledge of how to like navigate the, the data structure, the unstructured data store. Uh, and also kind of provide like a delight case working workflow on top of that so they could you know assign cases to each other mark things as fraud or not fraud etc and that was kind of how it started out so if we go to the next one so yeah we, we very quickly realized you know we've got data maybe we should get some data scientists in there to help us look at this uh you know we want to investigate machine learning and analytics how that could help us out identifying fraud so we did that in a really simple way initially we basically replicated the database that had that summarized data that the software engineers were creating. We chucked like a Jupyter notebook kind of environment on top of that and let the data scientists get to work uh, in notebooks, generating machine learning models in Python, uh, which we kind of then pushed into like a, a really simple batch prediction pipeline. Um, the software engineer helped them kind of set up that batch pipeline. Uh, so there was, you know, it was test driven already. We were starting to get some kind of cross pollination uh, in skills between a data scientist and the software engineer there. Like bringing testing engineering to that data science capability and the data scientist was starting to help out with the kind of data transformation understanding data uh, inside the app but bringing that kind of the data driven approach which we didn't have previously and yeah so we had the these batch machine learning predictions we were pushing that into into kafka and serving that up into that case working tool that the investigators were looking at so they could start to see some yeah some analytics around uh, the cases they're looking at we also found just from this, having a data scientist was really useful because they can provide just analytics around data and present that to, to your users. They can investigate stuff that, and understand data in a way that software engineers didn't look at it. And that was really useful just in terms of um, user engagement, understanding a domain better. And it really kind of encouraged us that, you know, data, data was a way forward for us and being more data focused was the way forward for, as a team. And yeah, uh, and we did, we had some success with the machine learning. It, was, it wasn't maybe a hundred percent success, but it kind of pointed in the direction as well that we should invest in this further. Uh, next please, sorry. So the application that we were getting data from was really starting to grow out. Um, there's 800 plus services on that, on that platform now. And we also noticed that because we were serving the data up in that, in that the unstructured, uh, storage tool with the dashboarding was starting to get used for reasons outside of the kind of the fraud use case, like, like um, performance analysis, for example, and, and general business intelligence reporting. So um, we needed to kind of grow that out as well. That, that, that tool was starting to struggle. And in that, the in-app data transformation was also struggling. So we were still doing all this in memory. We were, we were, our data load was increasing and we're trying to munge, munge more and more data together into, and push it out to RDS. Um, we also were restricted in what we could do in terms of the machine learning and the analytics, because uh, this was all just in memory Python as well. Uh, and we really, yeah, we basically need more compute power. 
around all that. Um, the first thing we tried, because we were, uh, I guess, software engineering focused, and we already had Kafka there, was we tried to use the Kappa architecture, where you basically try and do batch processing as event stream processing. Uh, something that's, you can probably uh, Google it and find out more about that. Um, and it didn't really work out for us. We had terabytes of data to process. It was really hard to, to, to kind of tweak Kafka to that extent. So it, it would you know, do this long hist historical processing we needed. We kept hitting memory constraints with the RocksDB that underpinned Kafka at the time and doing complex transformations that, you know, the stuff we would find easy in SQL was very hard to do programmatically with Kafka and event rendering and, and stuff like that. And fundamentally, um, we didn't need to be real time. Uh, so, you know, we were trying to kind of having, find the wrong tool to the job to a certain extent. So uh, next please, son. So we decided, let's try and apply some data engineering to this. And the kind of the first step we took was taking that summarized logic that was all inside the software and let's review that out into its own data pipeline. Let's uh, try using um, EMR and Spark in our case to help us solve this problem. And to do that kind of in the background, something we'd, we'd done was we'd started to fork our data out into like an S3 data lake. So we we got that separation from from the data store we were dependent on, and we yeah we basically gave ourselves access to to, to data tooling by doing that, which was great. Um, one thing that was interesting here is that we kind of automatically created like a domain based customer interaction pipeline because we were used to thinking in kind of a microservice way, uh, and applying that thinking. So we already had like a nice domain down. Um, uh, window for our for our pipeline and what we were processing, and that turned into like a like our first data product in a way. And this interaction data product, then um, we could feed that into into the RDS. Then we could process now like big sets of data. We'd solve the scaling issue uh, that we had with around our data size, and we could now surface that up to our case investigators and get much more like historical data. And that in turn empowered the data scientists. So the 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 kind of the the small Jupyter environment they had before was now all, all of a sudden could leverage the power of Spark and they could start to do real like longitudinal processing, improve the machine learning quite substantially and start to start to really, I guess by doing this and, and seeing things in terms of data products, we started to see all the other kinds of data products we could surface around, just behavioral insights into data to help, help the fraud investigators, um, machine learning as a, as a product as well. So that, that grew alongside this and we started to see we were very quickly growing into kind of like a data product focused team. Next please. Sorry. Um, just going to talk a bit about the kind of the cross-functional teams we had. So we, we embedded the data scientists in with the software engineers and, and the data engineers as well. So it was all one team uh, working together cross-functionally, um, which meant, you know, the data scientists would pair with the engineers. So we had full unit tested, integration tested data pipelines. And we had even had a few um, really cool cases where we used behavior driven development to spec out our pipelines. So we had like the, the product owner, the data scientist, an engineer, all working together on a, on a BDD test and really understanding from each other and bringing the different, you know, bringing the different uh, knowledge to, to that test which they're getting automate and run as part of the pipeline. Um, we, we added like a very simple metrics and monitoring platform for model observability. So we had an issue where one of our models did regress in production. So we added basically metrics and a learning so we could see if uh, how our models are performing. We, we could kind of shadow models out into live and see how they compared to the current live model. And that was uh, uh, yeah, really useful. Um, and as I guess as, yeah, as we grew, we had more monitoring, we started to like have multiple models out in production and, and keep an eye on them all. And yeah, and we, we started to shift that focus towards the analytical data products for our users, as opposed to, I guess, traditional software products. Next, please. Yeah, so as we, I guess, as we kind of already had these demand-made pipelines, so we started to kind of build out teams around these pipelines as well, and around the data products and around domains. And that meant we could start to grow analytics with those domains as well. So in our case, like one thing had was like, you know, fraud as a as an analytical use case versus how authentic is the data, 
and how much can you trust the data in your, in your, in your forward investigation. So those different domains we, we split out and we had different teams, different engineers and data scientists working across those domains. Um, so they could focus on those only. Um, Spark gave us some nice flexibility, but kind of a, a, as, a, as a platform tool and that engineers preferred Scala because they were familiar with it. They could do, you know, they could do the unit test driven stuff they were, they were, that they uh, already understood. They could do some of that complex uh, kind of transformations that are harder to do in SQL that you can do in code easier. And, but at the same time, data scientists preferred Python and SQL. So having, having Spark there with Spark SQL and Python, you got, you got the best of both worlds with the same platform underneath. Um, we also introduced as part of our data products, like a, a standard for our data products. In our case, it was S3 and Parquet with the patchy hoodie on top. And that meant we all knew how to interact, interrupt with our data products and we could bring them into, you know, bring the different products into different pipelines and, and service them in common ways. And yeah, we realized, I guess we have more and more data teams, data product teams building out. So we created a data platform team uh, to help start providing common tooling across those teams and make that, you know, the process of creating a data product just simpler, much like we're already doing like application platforms and digital platforms. So it's basically applying those same concepts that we already knew. Um, next slide, please, Simon. So if all that sounds familiar, uh, it, it's very similar to the stuff that's proposed in the, in the data mesh architecture. Um, I recommend giving it a Google if you don't know what data mesh is, but it's essentially taking all the learnings from domain, domain driven development and, uh, and application platforms, digital platforms, and applying that to data. Uh, so you end up, instead of having, you know, one data engineering team who's, who's doing the work, you have these domain focused data pipeline teams who are working, you know, across simple, small products that they're easy to understand and work on. And those teams remain cross-functional. So, you know, you're embedding data scientists into those teams and you really start, and you really starting to build out the platform uh, with many products on top and you're starting to scale uh, out accordingly because of that. Uh, next, please, Simon. Um, so what were some lessons we learned doing this? Um, Cross-functional teams are really good. Uh, you get that, you get a nice interplay between, you know, software engineers and data engineers and data scientists. They all have stuff they can help each other out with and, and different different angles to bring to any, to any um, you know, product solution. Um, Breaking like breaking your data problems down, keeping them small is really it's a really nice focused way to work. The kind of you know having bigger, larger data products which are more complex, uh, just it starts to get harder, right? And and more maintenance and more not more knowledge that people need and kind of cognitive load. So yeah, that that's more focused. The microservice kind of application of the domain driven development really helped there. Um, seeing like a data platform kind of emerge from a software platform was really interesting. That they are really the same as they're called. Cool. The fact we already, you know, we're very familiar with having an application platform that we kind of off, off shot from at the start really influenced our thinking all the way through and really made moving into a data mesh style data platform uh, very easy for us. And we could apply all our learnings to that. Um, software engineers make really good data engineers. So we kind of got this triangle on the side here. Uh, we quite often find, I guess this goes back to kind of Paul's point, it's hard to find data engineers, but we found that software engineers really pick it up very quickly. A lot of software engineering is very similar to, to data engineering and skill sets overlap quite a lot. And if a software engineer would pair of our data engineers, you know, and after, uh, you know, a few months or so, they would really start to pick up and understand and become a data engineer themselves really, uh, to the point I think everyone's just an engineer now uh, on our teams. And it's really worth embedding data scientists, data science early on, and the data scientists early on in your team if you, if you want to become data driven. But they really have a, a positive impact. Uh, all the different things they could bring around their knowledge of data, uh, and kind of and growing out into data products. And I think and data science is really something that can scale out with you, just like everything else. Um, that's it. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Simon, Scott, and Paul. Um, we're going to move on to our Q and A. Um, we've got some questions um, in the Q and A panel. Um, we just remind everybody: pop your questions in there. 
Um, there's a little voting button um, that you can do to uplift. We'll be taking the questions in priority order. Um, and so we'll start with Alberto's question. So I'll put this out to the panel. Um, so how do you connect the React UI with the, your data pipeline for client interaction and visualization? Who would like to take that one? Yeah, I think that one might be for me. Um, Scott and Paul might have other quite other answers. Um, so in our in our instance, um, obviously the the estimator part of the um, uh, um, but the, the algorithm effectively is exposed as a, a an API endpoint, right? So you're just making a call to that endpoint there to get your you know with your response and request effectively to get your answers. Um, there are as part of the visualization, we include some of the data to show to people, right? To show well, this is why the uh, this is kind of how the, the result was reached. Uh, and that's in an Aurora database, so part of the pipeline. I didn't show the whole thing there. I kind of excluded the, uh, the UI UX side of things, sort of focused on the data and the ML, because that's what I'm really interested in. Um, uh, but it's, uh, there's an Aurora database underneath where the, where the data is, and, and that's what the application pulls on. OK, so the next question. Um, what do you use for data import um, CSV files or API endpoints to push data into the RDB that um, becomes the initial data source of truth uh, for the data AI pipeline? Who would like to answer that one? No, no I'm referring to mine, uh, pushing into RDS. Um, yeah, we were, we were basically, because of initially because of the software base, we were just pushing through JDBC uh, from inside the code. Uh, and it was done that way. Um, yeah, uh, later on, like later on to move into more Spark, you're using, you know, big data batch formats like Parquet and stuff. So you're referring directly to object storage in S3. Uh, and then to load that into RDS, we're still using Spark pipeline to connect to RDS, which isn't optimal. There's some issues with that. Uh, RDS can struggle with having enough connections to match your Spark cluster. So you need to kind of bottle your Spark cluster a bit to match RDS. But yeah, hope that answers that. Cool, thanks, Scott. Um, so we know this um, this talk is going to be recorded, and the recording is going to be shared. Um, but just a question to the speakers: Are you are you okay to share the actual um, Google Slides um, after the talk as well? Yeah, I think that's that's. I'll, I'll leave that to Sheila. I mean, that's. I Perfect. think that's that, that's fine. Fantastic. Um, okay, so the next question. Do you use DynoDB to store the initial data coming from the client? Who would like to take that one? Uh, I think I, that was Scott as well. Yeah, my, yeah. Uh, and then we use the proprietary storage uh, in, that, in that in that unstructured store case. Uh, I'm not. I don't think I should name names, but yeah, we use the proprietary storage, <laughs> <laughs> proprietary unstructured data store that uh, had dashboarding analytics built on top. Great, thank you. Uh, so the next question, what are the main challenges in getting a model into production? Who would like to take that one? Oh, many and varied, Caitlin. I think that's, <laughs> we're all gonna, I think we should all have a stab at it, right? I will say okay. one of the things, let's, let's start with one of the things, okay? And quite often when you talk about ML ops, what people are thinking about the hosting the model, of course, that is an important thing. And you've got to think about that and what's the right way to make it and make it available and scalable and all that kind of stuff. But actually one of the other real challenges is, is um, it's acceptance of the results of that model. And that's one of the things we found out in, in, in our project and it's not, we, we, we see it all, all, you know, in many, many examples um, where, um, how do you how are you able to demonstrate to the end users that this thing is working in the way that's 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 acceptable to them um you know you, you it's quite easy to create a black box model that nobody knows what's going on and sometimes that doesn't matter right if you've got an algorithm that's fundamentally finding pictures of cats in a in, 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 on the internet then that's great that doesn't matter right you know people can see yeah it's a cat it's not a cat but if you've got something that's a bit more kind of complex like a pricing algorithm for example where it's like you know people are going to have an opinion and they want to know why your algorithm has come to that opinion and um i think that that validation you know don't don't underestimate the, 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 the that validation step i think is, is a really important one so is it the, the confidence level of the end user and kind of understanding the makeup of the model yeah yeah exactly and, and, and what can you do effectively to uh, uh 
to get them to trust it effectively, to build that trust in, in, in the model and in the users. Yeah. Great. Okay. So we still have um, a couple more questions. So I'm working on an AI data pipeline myself and would love to check this service um, later to run a couple of the use cases for my current workflow. So I think that's more of um, probably a, a general statement on the architecture diagram that you showed. So I'm looking. Uh, well, it might be, I think it looks like maybe that's Alberto saying, uh, are we able to check in at a later point mm. and, 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 and run through his use cases? And of course, yes, I think it's a short answer. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. But, <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, uh, afterwards, yeah. Cool. Um, so, the, so the next question, um, have you ever come across the issues related to data ownership during the productionization of data science? Who would like to take that? Is that more from a compliance perspective, I'm wondering? Yeah, what would be the... Yeah, I wonder if, if uh, Rugar can kind of give perhaps a bit, put a little bit of context. And I mean, I, I, the pro so probably our initial response is, is um, so we haven't, I don't think we, I've seen problems personally with, with ownership. It's always a challenge. If you, it depends on, so it can be a challenge getting hold of the data if the people who have the data don't want it to be worked on, right? Which is fine. <laughs> I mean, that's just life, isn't it? You know, there's not a lot you can do about that. Um, and I think sometimes we see challenges where um, you have the data available for training the model, for example, um, in, a, in a timely format that's appropriate for training it, but you don't have the data available for when that model is in use, right? So you might have a model that um, uh, needs to have data that's very recent, you know, it's, it's, it operates on an almost real time type basis. When you train it, you've got historical data and that's fine. But then when you move it into production, you need stuff that's very real and close to real time. Um, and that's that's a challenge you can see sometimes. Um, I, but I, I'm ownership, I'm, I'm saying that's all. Paul's got his hand up. Maybe he's got some thoughts here. Uh, yeah, I was just going to suggest <clears throat> um, one thing I've, I've noticed a little bit is that uh, when data scientists get involved um, and, and create either new, just new data sets or machine learning models, they are uh, just, uh, in my view, kind of creating new, da new data products. The data, they're, cre they're creating data it has value by combining other data that already exists. And I do find that can be a bit of a, a bit of an easily over, over like missed sort of detail, like uh, the, the, the data products that emerge from combining other data and doing data science are in fact themselves just data products as well. But the ownership for that um, can, can, can get lost, I find sometimes in, the year down the line, it's like, uh, who's, who's looking after that again? Or, yeah, it can, can be one, it can be a good one. Okay, thanks, Paul. Uh, we've got about uh, one one or two minutes left. So we've got one last question. Um, so how do you re um, retraining in case of um, supervised learning models? So how do you trigger that? Who would like to take that one? So I think there's lots of ways that you do it. So you might do it on a regular basis. Um, so, if, for example, if you're, you know, if your model is kind of as part of a batch thing, and there's a there's a you know a regular ingested data, then you can retrain the model on that basis. Um, uh, the uh, I guess the other reason it, it, I think it really depends on your ability to collect the um, ground truth data, doesn't it? Fundamentally. Um, so I know, for example, in in the case of the, of, of the pricing model, it's actually quite easy to get um, uh, ground truth data, right? Because you get you, you, these purchases happen and you know what the ground truth is, right? But for some of the fraud testing ones, right? You know, where you have, there's a, there's, there might be quite a long lag um, before you actually get that ground truth data, whether something is fraudulent or not, it's, it's, it's harder to get to that, the position where you have the, the ground truth. And I'm sure Scott's got some thoughts around that. Um, uh, I'm just trying to think of other other examples where the ground truth is, is something in the middle. So I mean, well, I mean, the other thing is um, where we have uh, AB testing. So for example, in some of the retail uh, um, use cases, you know, so Paul's one's a good one. Um, you, you might not have ground truth in that, so you might ground truth in not in quite the same way. But what you do have is the ability to test two models or more models against each other. You've got an AB testing framework or a multivariant testing framework, which means you can you can deploy several of them and you can retrain at you know whatever kind of frequency is is useful to you. Fantastic. I mean there there are lots more questions. So hopefully um, we'll be able to answer some of those questions after the talk as well. Um, but 
uh, we just wanted to thank everyone um, for their great questions and everyone in the audience for, for making the time to come to our talk. I hope you've really found it useful. Um, we're gonna send out the recording. Um, as you can see here, our next um, expert talk um, has moved uh, time slightly, but it's on Tuesday, March 8th at 6 p.m. Um, so how to manage multiple environments in a hyper-connected cloud world. So um, please do come and join us. And again, a big thanks to Simon, Paul, and Scott for today's talk.